Hi everyone, this is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception in Action podcast, and this is vlog number five. Today I want to talk about visual illusions and a couple of the interesting ways they're being used to study perception in action. So you've probably seen one. There's hundreds and hundreds of them out there, and it seems like new ones are being invented every day. A visual illusion is a configuration of visual stimuli, you know, lines or bars or colors, that causes a misperception in some way. Here's one of the most famous examples. Right? This is the well-known muller liar illusion. So we have two horizontal lines okay, with different patterns of configurations of arrows on the end. The actual horizontal parts of these lines are the same length. But most people perceive the top line as being much longer than the bottom line. Right? And that's the illusion, of course. For the longest time, I wasn't really particularly interested in illusions myself, you know, in most of them. Largely because they're very passive and two-dimensional and there's no way that an observer can act, interact with them, right? So I can't walk around and look at this from different perspectives, I can't hit it or catch it or throw it. So for a study of action, there's not really that much interesting about it for me. But more recently, people have been started making 3D versions of these illusions that do allow for that kind of interaction and have come up with some interesting ways to study perception and action. So the first one I want to talk to you about is some research that has been done to kind of test a, a very well-known theory in perception and action. A theory called the Two Visual Streams Hypothesis proposed by David Milner and Mel Goodale. And this hypothesis is the idea that within our brain we have two separate pathways for processing inf visual information. One pathway that just does perception. Okay? So it's involved when we want to identify something or make a verbal judgment. And another completely separate pathway that does perception for action. So it's involved in when we want to reach for an object or hit it or catch it. And one of the really interesting ways that people have been trying to test this is, as I said, making 3D versions of these illusions. So imagine I got some wood, cut it out, and recreated these two sets of two lines with the arrows uh, and put it on the desk in front of you. Okay? So if I did that, so I made 3D versions of it, you'd still get a perceptual illusion. So if I asked you which one was longer, you'd still say, the, the in this case, the top one. Okay? But the question is, if I asked you to pick them up, so if I asked you to reach out and grab the illusion with your hand, would the width of your fingers be susceptible to the illusion? Would you reach wider for this one than for that one? Okay? And this hypothesis and this dissociation between perception and perception and action is something I'm going to be talking about on an upcoming podcast where I interviewed Stephanie Rossett. This is going to be in episode 62, and she's done some really work, interesting work on patients um, with, that have a, a deficit in doing one or the other. So keep a lookout for that. But basically, what happens in these experiments? Well, it's actually quite a controversial area because people can't seem to agree on what methodology you actually need to use to compare reaching for the illusion versus making a passive judgment. But anyway, there does seem to be some indication that when you reach for an illusion, you're not as susceptible to it as when you just have to make a verbal judgment. That is, you know, your hand is adjusted correctly, not, uh, you know, tricked by the lines. Okay? But as I said, that's not an entirely consistent finding. The other example that's even more interesting to me is that people have started to use illusions with sporting tasks. And this actually started with some work by Jesse Witt and colleagues where she used the Ebbinghaus illusion. So here's the Ebbinghaus illusion. What we have is two circles, one surrounded by a bunch of big circles and one surrounded by a bunch of small circles. The circle in the center of these patterns are both the same size, okay? But most people see the one as surrounded by the small circles as bigger. And as proof, I've generated another figure where I completely block out the surrounds. And you can see they look the same, right? But then I put this back 
and this one hopefully looks bigger for you. If this is not working in this video, go, go look online. You should be able to find a good example of this. But what Jessie had people do, she projected these patterns on, the, on a golf green and had people putt to the, to the center target. And the question was, would that, have, because you perceive them as different, would it actually affect your putting performance? And before I tell you about her results, I thought I would try a little experiment on myself to see if this works. So off to the dartboard. So first up, I'm going to shoot at the perceptually smaller target. So for these throws, I'm going to aim at the central circle, but because it's surrounded by bigger circles, it's going to look like it's smaller to me than it actually is. So let's see how I do. Okay, now I'm going to shoot at the perceptually larger target. So again, I'm aiming for the middle circle here, but because it's surrounded by small circles now, perceptually it looks bigger to me. Does that make any difference in my shooting performance? Okay, we're back. So you saw there might have been a little bit of an effect there. I'll get to that in a second. But what Jesse found basically was that people sunk more pots when putting to the perceptually larger target than the perceptually smaller one, even though the holes are the same size. So quite a remarkable finding. And for what it's worth, in my dart example, I actually shot 20 darts, so you didn't see them all there, uh, threw 20 darts for each of those targets and my accuracy was one centimeter better for the perceptually larger target. So consistent with the finding. You know, obviously I need to do more to do statistics and we counterbalance the order and all that stuff for a good experiment, but that was just a demo. More recently, um, Gabby Wolf and colleagues have looked at training people with this illusion. So what they've done is have people putt uh, that are not experienced golfers, either to this one or this one during practice. And what you find is during practice itself, you get the same effect that Jesse Witt saw. So people start to get lower and lower putting errors for this one as compared to this one. They also, Gabby and colleagues found that people have higher self-efficacy, so they're in confidence. So there seem to be, you know, even this perceptually larger thing seems to be having effect. But the most profound finding in her study was in, her, in essentially a transfer test. So after learning, she took away all the surrounding circles okay, the, and had people putt just to the center target, right? so just to a golf hole. And so now you've removed the illusion, but what she found was that people that trained with this one, the perceptually larger, did better for just the golf hole than people that trained with this. So that's quite a really, quite an interesting finding. And I thought it was a pretty big deal because back in episode 15D, uh, it was one of my top stories of the year for that year in, in, in terms of research. So I think that's a really interesting finding and I hope to see a lot more on training with illusions. I think it's a really interesting idea. So that's all I wanted to cover with illusions. Coming up soon on the podcast, I'm going to do a deeper dive into something I mentioned in my very first vlog, uh, intermittent vision. And I now have two different sets of equipment for doing that. I have those shutter glasses I showed you for sports training in the first video, and I now have a, set of, a new set of Play-Doh glasses which are used for research. So what I'm gonna do is compare and contrast those and show you all the different settings, and this is going to actually accompany a podcast episode where I'll dig into all the research findings with these different devices. So that's it for the, today, the, uh, vlog number five. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now.